This is Nen Park, home of Rushden Diamonds Football Club. Impressive, isn't it? Its fine stands, playing surface and facilities bear comparison with any outside the football league. A spirit of optimism exudes from every breeze block, crash barrier and tuft of grass. As the future beckons, exciting, unpredictable, it is an appropriate time to pause and reflect, not where to, but where from. For despite the ultra-modern setting of a stadium designed for the 21st century, this club has roots in Victorian times, when organised football itself was in its infancy. Rushton Town Football Club was originally formed in 1889, and over the next hundred years achieved an exalted position amongst county teams. Its golden age was the 30s, when the Russians topped the United Counties League for four successive seasons, reached six consecutive NFA Senior Cup Finals, and collected the UCL Knockout Cup four times in five years. Crowds continued to flock to Hayden Road after the war, and its four admission gates proved most useful in coping with the 5,600 who attended an FA Cup match with Kettering in 1947. Further UCL championships were won, first in 1963-64 and again nine years later. Although the club vacated their old ground in 1992, the wooden grandstand, erected and opened in 1922 with a visit from Aston Villa, remains a monument to a past footballing age. Rushton youngsters, perhaps one day destined to wear the senior club's colours, fulfil youth league fixtures on the pitch under the watchful eyes of Secretary Colin Wright, our guide through an evocative tour of the building. Well, this is, as you can see, the main stand built many years ago, um, still with the name of Russian Town Football Club at the top there. And we're now going through the players' entrance. As we go through the players' entrance, you'll actually notice above the door a plaque in memory of Cyril Freeman, who for 30 years was the honorary secretary of Russian Town Football Club, 1919 to 1949. This is where the players enjoy their daily, their weekly trip into the dressing rooms to play each game. This is the visitors' changing room. And as you look around you, it really hasn't changed much from the time that the the Lillian Stadium was built. The paintwork, I believe, is still the not actually the original because we have obviously been painted over it, but it's the same colour scheme. No doubt over the years the shells have been modernised and changed. My understanding is that at one point it used to be just a big hot bath and no shells. then go to what I class as the main room, and that's that of the referees. And again, as you can see, it's of the 1926 setting. And from here, we go into the Russian town that was home dressing room, as you will notice that there really is no difference between this and the visitors' teams, though it may be just marginally bigger, but as the host home team there was no priority given. entrance which is an entrance for all the spectators you can actually see the turnstiles which they came through and paid their relevant shillings and pence to watch the game. You can almost imagine what a crowd of 2,000 up to the maximum of 5,000 
was in those days with the turn of the people coming through the turnstiles. Its dressing rooms, spartan and desolate, seem to echo with voices from the past. Reggie Bland, Johnny Hindmarsh, George Hilliard, Len Pipes, Ron Peacock, Charlie Marlowe, Terry Murray, Joe Payne, Ken Ambridge, and, of course, Cyril Freeman. Three old players, Dennis Maddams, George Harrison, and Hoddy Childs, recall those Hayden Road days with affection. I started playing regularly when I came back out of the army. You know, I was, I was um, playing in that game you mentioned earlier about the Kettering and the FA Cup, which was still is the biggest crowd at, yeah. for the ground at Hayden Road. Yeah. Yeah. Football enjoyed a boom time after the war. Yeah. There wasn't so much, there wasn't so many other um, attractions. Consequently, money everybody. Money. Everybody used to follow the local team, you know, and it, yeah. it was always a needle match against Ketra, yeah. home or away. Yeah. Very heavy ground. In the, especially in the FA Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very heavy ground and the football was real, real leather there and they like a ton weight there. <laughs> they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't kick them like they do now. No, not halfway down the bloody half. Yeah. No, somebody there. Yeah. We had one chap who brought to Wallenborough went down Wallenborough, he was a halfback. We had him there. God, he, he enjoyed himself. We never gave him the ball with it. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have got to him, that was dead, it was finished, you see. Yeah. So he never had the ball, but the marvellous game oh, he yeah. had. <laughs> oh, well, you know, we played football when it were played. <laughs> we played football well, when we, it were played. I say, we were never told how to, how to play. And they done, and they say, you mark him and you mark him. I used to go to Ballin Barrow and old George Hilly there, he'd start George off, Hilly, straight, yeah. straight, straight away playing against them, he'd say, now you follow him about, you follow him, and that, <laughs> there was nothing like that, he used to say, keen and clean, that's all he said, and that's it, and we've never told they were to play at all. But by the early 1990s, the financial pressures of competing in the Beza Southern League and spiralling maintenance costs at the ground plunged the club into crisis. Its demise was imminent. Football's post-war boom found youthful expression just three miles up the A6 at Earthlingborough. There, an enthusiastic bunch of youngsters formed the club that gave its unique appendage to the current team, the Diamonds. A founder member, Tony Jones. First, in actual fact, it was immediately after the end of the war when uh, all the lads wanted to be playing football and uh, there were two teams in Earthlingborough formed. Uh, one was called the Earthlingborough uh, Wolves, and another lot of boys became the Earthlingborough Diamonds. And uh, there was a merger at that particular time as well, when the two lots of lads, of which I was one of them, all about 15, 16 years of age, got together, hence the meeting in the vestry. And uh, one club was then, uh, in, brought into being, and that was the Earthenwood Arms as we, as we knew it for the next 40 odd years. So yes, that did start in the vestry. Um, the name itself, which has intrigued a lot of people, the Diamonds, uh, came because uh, the Russian team, Moscow Dynamos, after all the war years with no competitive football during the years, uh, came to England played four major matches against top teams, including Arsenal, Glasgow Rangers, etc. And this caused a lot of interest amongst all us lads. And when we wanted to have a name, we said, well, let's call ourselves the Earthenwood Dynamos. But after only a week or two, it was considered to be a little bit of a, uh, a copycat situation. So some bright one amongst us, I can't remember who it was, I said, well, now let's call it the Diamonds, which was the nearest thing we could get the Dynamos without an actual copy. And that's how the name was actually uh, brought about. And we, we eventually then started playing in the Rushton District 
youth league, which was for under eight, under 18 players. And we kept in that for the next nine years, 1956, before we changed. But father, of course, who had been a local footballer as well, and actually interested in the game, and I was his lad of 15 years of age at the time, um, he became chairman of the club as such as it was in those days. And as we progressed, he continued as, chair, as, as chairman. Uh, I became secretary, and I was secretary for 25 years, uh, until such time later on I took over as, as chairman from my father. So, but I, in, in the very early stages, I was a player. I, I was a goalkeeper, and I also did a bit of the secretarial work as, as well, such as it was. Obviously, it was very limited in those days. From our very early days, uh, when we moved from the final road down to the recreation ground, we always had the ambition to want our own, our own ground. And uh, I negotiated with uh, the local water board at the time for the land, which is now known as Men Park. Um, and um, when we purchased that land, obviously the fact that all of us, uh, by that time, young men, were uh, very keen together to take the club into a, a, a higher strata, into a, into, into a new era completely. And so, yeah, that was a very exciting time when we uh, all got together, armed with our picks and shovels, and, and physically did most of the work, apart from sort of uh, getting the land and wanting to do all of the other things, we, we physically did most of it ourselves along the way. So that obviously was a, a very exciting time and, and a, a particular high point. Success on the field brought four UCL titles and a variety of trophies in the ensuing 20 years. Surely Roger Ashby's size deserved kinder fortune than the FA VAR semi-final defeats which denied Wembley appearances in 1981 and 84. But, as at Rushton, by the early 90s the climate had changed. Cold drafts were circulating in Nen Park. Poor performances on the field brought a decline in support. As Tony Jones quickly perceived, a drastic remedy was required. He cast his eyes up the Higham Road. A merger of the two clubs, traditional rivals, each with their own heritage and identity. Feathers would be ruffled. A drastic remedy indeed. Neil Gunt was chairman of Rosden Town. How did you feel, Neil, when the merger was first muted? Uh, I was reasonably keen on the idea because after struggling for three years trying to re relocate the Rushton Town ground and trying to find a new ground for it, which had become an impossibility, uh, it was the only way forward. So I, I, was, I was all for it and uh, when Tony Jones rung me around about the Christmas time of 91 I uh, was keen on having a meeting with him, which we had, and uh, so we went. After the meeting, we got the idea, yes, it could be Roger and Diamonds, and we decided to go back and speak to our own small committees and see what they thought about it, which wasn't, didn't go down too well at the time, but... Uh, Can you remember any of the worries that other people on the committee had? Well, I think the biggest worry they all had was that Rochester and Diamonds in the time had been a two teams that uh, was at loggerheads, if you like, right. because they were the two local sides. And there were always good games between them. And uh, one or two people said, maybe we can't take Rochester down over the river. <laughs> How did Neil feel about it? Was he surprised? Uh, I think he, like myself, was feeling the pressure of, of running a club under difficult circumstances. He knew that once we'd acquired Max onto the board of Earthmer Diamonds, that that could be a further problem for Rushton Town, although, of course, they were in a league higher. And that, incidentally, was a point as well that obviously attracted Max as well, because if we could pull the two clubs together uh, down at the Nen Park, uh, then with Rushton's status of being a higher league, um, 
it looked a pretty good deal overall. And so that, but Neil, no, he 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 was a realist, and he quickly realised that this was the really only answer to um, uh, to saving what was left of, of Rosedon's footballing uh, prowess, and so he he agreed to come on board as well. So the unlikeliest of unions was fashioned out of extremity, under the patronage of Max Griggs, chairman of the famous Dr. Martin's Boot Company. In that fateful summer of 1993, he spoke prophetically to Peter de Blanc of his plans for the club. Uh, Max, who took over as chairman of the Brisbane and Darwin's Football Club last year, um, new club, new aspirations, you must be very happy with the way things are going. I've been very pleased with the way the two clubs have come together. It's been absolutely fantastic. Everybody works hard behind the scenes as well as the team doing well. Uh, at the moment we're riding high in the league. I'm hoping that uh, we can maintain this position and in our first season hopefully achieve our ambition to get into the Premier League. Yeah. But beyond this, of course, we are looking to hopefully get into the GM conference within five years. Um, after that, of course, uh, if the opportunity is ever there to present itself, we would always take the, take it, you know, we wouldn't be afraid to take that opportunity to go further if necessary. Right, Max, well, we've heard the football inside of the story. Um, now, what about the ground? Obviously, if you're going for a conference, um, you know, things are going to be brought up to scratch, I'm sure. Could you, would you like to tell us what you've got in mind for the next five years, ten years? Well, as you can see, we already made a start on improving the ground facilities. On this side of the ground, we're already started on our new thousand seater stand. This will also include uh, refreshment room, toilet facilities, and also extra turnstiles. On the front part where the training pitch is at the moment, that is gonna be set out as a new car park. In addition to that, we're hoping to get planning for new lighting, which will be far more powerful than the ones we've got. And the ground here, which will take six inches of the surface away, which will re redo the whole thing with proper drainage, which will put a layer of gravel, a layer of sand, and a layer of soil. So we hope to get here a beautiful surface to match the good facilities that we're providing. Uh, after this, of course, when that side is done, we're then looking at the main stand here. And here, apart from being just a football stand, we shall have a function room, we shall have executive boxes, we shall have a vice president's room, a restaurant and a gymnasium, as well as obviously improving the, uh, the changing rooms for the home and away teams. So this stand here is going to be something quite unique, I think, in football, uh, in as much as it will not just be for football, but will be for other things as well. Which is, which is my opinion, is the way to sell football in the future. Football needs something else other than just football to keep it alive. And that, that is what I'm trying to achieve here. Work on the ground continued throughout the following season. The summer of 1993 saw the gradual emergence of the thousand-seater North Stand. A bold and perhaps visionary step in view of the club's average home attendance of 300 during that first season. Well, we started on the north side, which is the stand behind me. Um, there was originally a, a small stand there, which uh, held probably 150, 200 people at most. Uh, we demolished that. Uh, it had been built out of uh, an old uh, shed, and the, the concrete posts uh, were dug into the ground about three metres with uh, an awful lot of concrete uh, in them. Uh, we took about three days to break all this concrete out and we ended up with quite a big pile of it. Uh, after that was done we then started on the foundations and the new bases for the steel structure. Uh, the steel structure was then uh, erected uh, without the roof on. This was followed by some of the brickwork and then the concrete uh, stepped uh, terracing for the seats. Uh, which was quite a quite a good job. It was a, it went up very quickly, and you felt you were achieving something then. After that, the the roof was uh, put on, 
and we were then able to put the remainder of the brickwork up, uh, the roof cladding and, and the seats in yeah. and in a very short time we, we felt we were looking at a proper stand. It made the south side which held the original stand, uh, seating stand and the clubhouse uh, made that look very small which originally it looked quite large compared with the old one. And so to 1993-94. Development work continued relentlessly. Week by week, fascinated spectators stared in amazement as the South Stand and Diamond Centre emerged from mountains of material heaped alongside the touchline. In the highly competitive world of modern football, the financial health of a club is critical to survival. Commercial manager Bernard Lake, a former devotee of the old Rushton town, explains. That side of the club is very, very important uh, and a lot of it depend, is, is relying on what income you can get in. To me, the income we get is, is down to me how I do it and, and how I do that is basically uh, income out of the club shop on Saturdays which is going very, very well and also uh, a weekly competition that we run. Then we've got a lot, to, uh, a big range of uh, old programs which a lot of people think what do you want programs for you'd be surprised how many people come in to look at old programs at football league clubs and while they're in here nine times out of ten they'll buy a pen or they'll, they'll buy a bubble app uh, so it's it's sort of a spat to catch a mackerel really you, you, you get them in uh, on small stuff and hopefully nine times out of ten it works they, they buy things you've got the, the metal badges now that is another big seller uh, which uh, a lot of people buy and a lot of collectors come from all over the different country and, and write to me. Uh, we get requests every week for uh, either programs or metal badges. But this progress was not confined to construction work and commercial enterprise. On the pitch itself, manager Roger Ashby's team was amassing a healthy pile of Visa League points, making promotion a distinct possibility. Max Griggs uh you know, he's a superb man, there's no question about it, and uh, he set his ambitions uh, when the, fir you know, the first signs of the amalgamation, and uh, I think many of people must have stood back and thought, well, you know, can we honestly uh, see a, a stadium uh, approaching, what, 7,000 capacity? Uh, can you really justify, you know, having a stadium as such uh, in, in a small place like uh, Earthingborough? With, with, uh, I believe there's only about the 5,000 population. But uh, I think, you know, since uh, word go, uh, the, the chairman's ambition has been to certainly uh, uh, get a super stadium, right? And it's now taking shape. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a great believer that uh, a lot of people have been very, very surprised at the way things have gelled together and also the attendances that uh, have improved, uh, well, Last season we were averaging 250 spectators, this time a thousand. And I think it's mainly due uh, to two things. Obviously it's a super stadium, I mean, it's progressing week by week and, it, and it's comfortable. And I think spectators nowadays uh, want comfort and uh, you know, you can ask for anything better as regards the ground. And also um, Max is uh, investing quite heavily on the playing side as well. And. Uh, we're reaping the rewards out in the park as well because it, you know, both the stadium and the team have got to run alongside. It's no good having a super stadium with a, with a poor team in it. You know, so we, we are ambitious together. Obviously, Max with the stadium, myself on the managerial side, of making sure that uh, we get both things right and uh, the way things are going. Uh, you know, let's hope we can continue in the same vein as uh, what's happened so far. Two of the team's key performers throughout the season. Aidy Mann, probably more highly motivated and disciplined than at any time in his career, and top scorer Mickey Nuttall expressed players' thoughts on the club's potential. That's unbelievable. I mean, you know, as people, a lot of people have been down here, and the setup's absolutely, absolutely magnificent. Uh, you got the chairman behind, who's put his money in. The gaffer's brilliant. The lads are great. It's, you know, you couldn't ask for a better club really outside of uh, league football. You know, it's absolutely unbelievable. Well, I came to the club two years ago when they first formed. Yeah. 
and uh, the first season was a bit strange, you know, a new team, everybody was new to each other, but after a while we settled in and that, and we done we done reasonably well, we felt we was a bit unlucky not to go up last year, but obviously in the summer, uh, the club's just transformed, I mean, the stands have been knocked down, and there's uh, things have been put in their place, you know, you, 12 months ago you wouldn't have believed. I played in the conference and uh, well really when this stadium's done I've been to every conference ground in the country and uh, this will surpass all them and uh, hopefully I'll still be here to go to, to be with the club when they do get in the conference. In March 1994, victory over Western Supermare, serious rivals for a promotion place, assumed crucial significance. And so, with a finishing flourish of five straight wins, the league championship was achieved. The final game against Redditch brought a handsome 7-0 victory to set the seal on a marvellous season. For good measure, Rushton Diamonds added the Northant Senior Cup to their boardroom trophy cabinet, beating Kettering Town 3-2 in the semi-final in front of a record capacity attendance of 2,500. perfect ending to a perfect season. However, the last word must go to the club's chairman, Mr Max Briggs. Eighteen months ago, you expressed your hopes for how the club will develop. Um, looking around today, how do you feel you've progressed? Fantastic for us in 18 months. We've built a football team which won promotion last season. We're now in the Premier Division. We're looking forward to next season, hopefully, a repeat performance. Uh, we've also built this wonderful stadium, which is, uh, as you can see, wonderful facilities for people to come along, not only use just for football, but for other functions, uh, wedding receptions, conferences. So it's not just a place for football, it's a place for other people who have other interests as well. But hopefully by coming here and doing all these things, they may of course be also interested in football. But what we've got to do is to get a successful team, which obviously is going to highlight this place and put us on the map in this area. And the more successful we are, the more successful we will be in this wonderful facility we've got here. Go We're sitting in the Diamond Centre. This is new. This is part of that dream that you've achieved. Um, could you perhaps take us on a tour of the building and let's have a look at the facilities you've described so eloquently? Yeah, I'm very proud of what has been achieved and uh, when anybody comes I'm always pleased to show them around anyway. Uh, you see it's allocated up in there. Sit down there, you see. And there's your football. <laughs> now this is what you've really yes. Come to see, yes. This is the bit I like. Absolutely. This is the bit we all like football. I mean, what we've got here is something quite unique for a small town like Roasting and Earthingbury, isn't it, really? Yeah. But I believe people support it. You know, if you've got the football and you've got all these other interesting things behind it, people talk about it and they want to come and be part of it. Oh, they're certainly talking. Yes. And the road networks, of course, from A45, A1, M1 link, we're all in the right position. Aren't we? What about access to the ground? Because that's, as a spectator, that's been a bit of a problem for me. Yes, yes. Um, I understand well, you're doing yes. something about the road. Well, we've got plans to build a roundabout near the Earthingbow Road, and coming across the top piece of this land, then coming across, and then it will make all this area at the back more car parking. And then obviously that way out would make an easier access to the roundabout and so forth to get away on the A6 or the A45. But it depends really on how far we can go now with building this extra stand. It depends on us getting this roundabout so, and road accessing. 
we must have better access now to, to proceed any further beyond what we're doing now. So an extra stand here. We're talking about here um, a terrace, more executive suites and then a double decker. So this will be much higher at this end. But that all depends on us getting planning permission for that roundabout because they won't give us planning permission without easier access and obviously safety as well. But at the moment we've got that permission to do that end and so we could hold here four, four and a half thousand now and that would hold another four and a half. Yeah. So we're talking about eight, nine thousand, you know, if, when it's fully done. And then of course if we could get that part sorted out, I mean eventually you could have another stand right above that one, which could bring you up to 15,000 if you want to yeah. We want to get in the conference. We've said we've said that five years, and it's been two years now, we want to be in the conference. Mm. So this is our third season as Roosters and Diamonds. Now if we do it this year, then we'll be beat our target of five yes. years. Yes. But five years, we said, five, five years, five seasons, we wanted to be in the conference. But if, if we can do it in three, then so much the better. And then after that, well, I'd go for the league if the opportunity was there, but if it didn't happen just like that, I wouldn't think, you know, perhaps a season or two in the conference wouldn't do us any harm. Because I think we'd be done marvellously well to achieve yes. conference yes. level yes. in such a short time. Yeah. Because and you've got to be realistic, but if you run too fast, that's right. something can, you know, leg you up along the way and it can all come tumbling down again. So that's I true. think we should pass the field when we got to the conference then, you know we've done jolly well. And if we can maintain that, I think we should always have the interest here. With the possibility that we could go ahead at any time. Yeah. Which I'd always take if the opportunity was there. I'd never be afraid to take it. Yeah. No ambitious to uh, uh, be part of football. I've never... Uh, when I was a director of Northampton, but of course at Northampton I couldn't do anything like this because the ground was owned by the Cockrell Trust. But here, I've... Um, I mean... Maybe times are different. I mean, we've been more successful over the years, and obviously, I've been in a position to do these things. Whereas, you go back 10 years, I wouldn't have been able to do this 10 years ago. 